Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, colleagues, judge, members of the public, it's an absolute privilege to stand here in front of you today and to address you on a topic which I am very passionate about, and that is immigration and international relocation, specifically with uh, minor children. Now, just in case, folks, you think I'm extremely generous to fly down from Joburg to Cape Town, Cape Town is absolutely beautiful, and I just needed an excuse. So thank you for the excuse, Dion. I. I really do appreciate it. Folks, my presentation today will serve as a bit of an introduction to some of the other presentations which you will be seeing today um, by esteemed colleagues of mine who are here um, on various specialized focused aspects, Hague Convention, Remo Act, etc. Sorry, Natalie, I've, I'll, oh, I'll scooch down for you. Um, right, um, okay, good? Okay, fantastic, thank you. So my hope is to give you a bit of an overview as a starting point to better understand and have a foundational uh, grasp of the concepts which um, our speakers later will be talking about. So, folks, um, I'd like to start off with a quote by Anthony Bourdain. Uh, if I'm an advocate for anything, it is to move as far as you can, as much as you can, across the ocean or simply across the river. Walk in someone else's shoes or at least eat their food. It's a plus for everybody. Now, the reality is, folks, that South Africans are becoming increasingly globalized. South Africans are on the move. When you are in the south of London and you can order food in Afrikaans, you know South Africans are on the move. When you are anywhere in Europe and you see people speaking your language, talking about your interests, cricket, rugby, etc., you know South Africans are on the move. So what I've done as a bit of an intro is I've taken uh, just a snapshot of a few recent headlines without saying that I agree with any of them as a, as a big caveat. Um, these are all headlines in the last year about um, South Africans abroad. And my favorite one is Checkers runs ads in UK, Australia to remind expats of better lifestyle in South Africa. And I'm sure we can all attest we are very, very spoiled in, in many uh, respects. And we're very, very blessed to be where we are. However, it illustrates the point, folks, that South Africans are seeking opportunities abroad. What I would like to up with a new type of family unit to which the rules still apply, but they apply in a different way. Um, and we'll go into that a little bit later. And in talking about the expat family unit, we must further distinguish between two types of expatriate family unit. And the first one I'd like to talk to you about is the concentrated expat family unit. Uh, you'll see from my clip art there, it is um, two parents, two children, and this is a concentrated unit, which we can define as follows. It refers to a family structure in which a small group of expats, typically consisting of parents and their dependent children, reside together in a foreign country for an extended period of time. The family unit lives in close proximity. This is the main overriding a uh, component of the expat uh, or the concentrated expat family unit is they are in close proximity, they share resources resource, and they rely on each other for support while living abroad. The term concentrated specifically emphasizes the close-knit nature of this family unit. They live abroad together, simply put. The second expat family unit, if I can there we go, is 
the more unfortunate separated expat family unit. And in a previous sitting of uh, this specific presentation, one of my attendees uh, almost became distraught and made the point that where there is a separated expat family unit, there will always be a loser. There will always be a parent or a holder of parental responsibilities and rights, be it family member or a friend who has acquired. There will always be someone left outside alone. That is the reality of the separated expat family unit. So, the definition which I, I've put in, those of you who have great reading glasses, please do read along on your on your printouts. I didn't realize my font was as small, so I apologize for that. A separated expat family unit refers to family structure in which one or more parents who hold PR and R live separately from their minor children while residing abroad. Often occurs due to circumstances that require one parent to be in a different location than the rest of the family, such as work, divorce, visa concerns, etc. And here is the, the sad reality. In this family structure, the child is usually separated from one of the co-holders of parental responsibilities and rights. And obviously, this creates unique challenges in maintaining family relationships and ensuring that the child's needs are met. And as I will show you later, guardianship is of uh, particular concern. So, as an expat Family Law 101 course, I would like to uh, just go through a few legal principles. I will try to keep it short, succinct, because I know that a lot of these are um, aspects which you have uh, dealt with at length. But for completeness sake, let's run through them. Obviously, where do we start when it comes to children? We start with the Children's Act. And when we go to the Children's Act, numbering always starts at seven. You start with the best interest of the child standard. I'm not going to go through the best interest of the child standard. As we all know, in all matters where there is a child involved, best interests of the child are paramount. So everything that we will be discussing in respect of expat family units with children must be seen through the lens of the best interests of the child standard which can be found in section 7 of the Children's Act and which I will not uh, belabor. Now where this becomes very relevant is I will be going through a couple of recent judgments, uh, unreported judgments mostly, to show you how the courts have dealt with the issue of the best interest of the child standard in relation to, um, to uh, international relocation. The second one, and it's an oft forgotten one, ladies and gentlemen, and I urge you to really take note of this next one, is section 31.1. I'm going to go back to guardianship in a, in a second. And section 31.1 refers to major decisions concerning a child insofar as child participation is, con uh, is concerned. And as you will see under uh, subsection B of the section, uh, any matter listed in section 183C, which is our guardianship issues, which we'll look at now, any matter affecting contact, and any matter which is likely to significantly change or to have an adverse effect on the child's uh, living conditions, etc. In those instances, the minor child's views and wishes must be taken into consideration. And unfortunately, very often, we see with these types of uh, relocation matters that the child is nothing more than a uh, passenger. In fact, the first thing the child knows is pack your bags. We are getting on the plane. Um, well, not quite as extreme, but a fate accompli is presented to the child. We are moving abroad. This is the way it is. Then I'd like to talk to you about Section 18 of the Children's Act, and specifically Section 18.3. We will be dealing with this a little bit in the case, but 18.3c specifically, folks, take note of it. Consenting to the child's departure or removal from the Republic and consent to the child's application for a passport falls under our 18.3c factors. Now, what are those? 
Those are aspects where all holders of guardianship, i.e. both parents, must consent. You cannot simply remove a child from South Africa without the consent of both parents. You cannot simply apply for a passport uh, without the consent of both parents. And if one looks at the word on the street, in some instances, uh, even the consent is not enough. Very often, uh, home affairs needs both parents to be present uh, when the passport is applied for. The third provision that we are going to be looking at, and these, as I say, folks, just keep these as a foundational basis to understand the remainder of, of my talk today, um, is the issue of termination and suspension. Uh, it is unfortunately something that we see very frequently in expatriate um, divorce, uh, well, expatriate uh, matters, be it in divorce, be it in the context of uh, post-divorce, be it in the context of uh, unmarried persons. Very often, the one party's parental responsibilities and rights uh, will be suspended or terminated, as I will show you in some of the judgments, which I will share with you a little bit later. Okay, so is everyone still with me? So far, so good. Got time? Great. I've got a few more minutes. Great. So these are the basics. Um, in case you are concerned that um, I'm just going to tell you everything you know already, let's go to a little bit more obscure stuff. Let's go into the Immigration Act of 2002. And therein, under Section uh, 9 sub 3a, lies our first problem when it comes to international relocation. No person can leave the Republic without a valid passport, obviously. Simple as that. Then we look at the South African Passports and Travel Documents Act of 1994, which gives the minister um, the power to make regulations in respect of how customs officials sitting at the various ports of entry will deal with um, persons going through customs at that stage. So what is the status quo with that? Um, it is the following. Let's distinguish again between the concentrated and the separated expatriate family. The concentrated expatriate family is very, very simple. You need a copy of birth certificate and you need a valid passport. Both parents are present. Obviously, your customs official will see that both of the parents are there. Both of their names will generally be in the passport. They cross-check it with the parent's passport. They give you the thumbs up and, and you go. It is highly unlikely in that scenario that one of the parents would be there with the child and not consent. So consent is fairly obvious. When we look at the separated expatriate family, however, it becomes a little bit more problematic. You'll see our list is significantly longer than the previous uh, slide. Obviously, valid passport, as we learned earlier. Copy of the birth certificate, equivalent document. So far, so good. And here comes some of the more contentious issues. The parental consent letter or affidavit in most cases. A copy of the passport or identity document of the absent parent, contact details of the absent parent, and where applicable, either a copy of the court order granting full PR&R in respect the child to the traveling parent or a copy of the death certificate. The reason, obviously, folks, is Section 18.3c um, prevents parents from simply leaving the country without the consent of other holders of guardianship, and this is to give effect to it, specifically the requirement of the parental consent letter. Right. So, essentially, folks, immigration in practical terms can happen in one of two ways. In the 18 years back, I'll give away my age, the first 18, not the recent one, uh, they used to say we can do this the hard way or the easy way. 
And uh, in, in immigration matters, it is specifically um, very, very um, pertinent, the, the difference between the two. Now, when you look at international relocation with a minor child, essentially these are the scenarios that are presented. The first scenario is abduction, and then obviously the Hague Convention uh, comes into play, and I look forward to hearing uh, my colleague Eugene uh, Oppenman speaking about that a little bit later. Then we get relocation by consent, which I've, for practical purposes, split into two um, specific sections, being informal and formal processes, and I'll take you through that a little bit later. And then, finally, we get our opposed relocations, which end up uh, running through the courts um, where the court really has to deal with it. And specifically for now, at least, until the amendments the, to the Children's Act are um, come into to working in terms of guardianship in the children's courts, these are high court applications. And we know high court applications um, really are um, often prohibitively expensive. So this is the informal structure of immigration by consent, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, it is quite simple, very little red tape, very little planning, very little structure. Parent one goes to parent two, says, I want to relocate to location Z. Parent two says, no problem, signs the parental consent affidavit. The parties drive to Cape Town International Airport on the next Emirates flight out of here, gone. Right. Now, there are a few very problematic elements to that. Number one, there is no future planning. There is no provision for what will happen if things go wrong down the line. There is very high potential for co-parenting difficulties post-relocation because what happens? You create an unequal relationship between the parents. The parent sitting overseas with the child has all the power. The parent sitting in South Africa has no power and no document to protect them. Usually in these cases, there's no or very little adherence to Section 311 child participation. Uh, the only benefit to this, obviously, is that there are very few formal steps required. Now, the bottom two are very interesting. There's no court intervention, obviously. In fact, the court does not know that this child is leaving the country because, quite frankly, no one has alerted the court. No one has issued court process. And further, the Family Advocates Office also has no knowledge of this relocation, um, and they can obviously not intervene. Now, juxtaposed with the informal structure, we see a few extra steps, four steps versus, um, if I can remember to count on a Saturday, seven steps. Um, this is the formal structure of a relocation. It's a bit more onerous, but I would dare say it is much more sensible. So once again, it starts with consent being sought, consent being granted. Thereafter, a parenting plan would be prepared. There would be a formal child participation in terms of uh, the Children's Act, Section 31.1 and Section 10. Um, and then the matter would go through the family advocate all the way to court. And I'll tell you why it goes to court generally in a, in a little while, where after the departure from the Republic takes place. Now, the benefits are, obviously, in this instance, you have a document um, that regulates future um, planning. The potential for parenting difficulties are greatly ameliorate if you have a proper parenting plan. Uh, there is adherence to Section 31.1. Um, there is court intervention. There is family advocates office intervention. But obviously, this comes at the price of several formal steps which are required. Just one caveat, folks, and it's not on my slide, but it is very important to understand. The minute the child leaves 
the Republic of South Africa. The South African courts and the South African legal system do not have jurisdiction over that child anymore. One notable exception is your Hague matters, where the central authority would intervene to get an abducted child back. So this is not a silver bullet. I'm not saying do this and you'll be fine. This is certainly more sensible, but there are also practical limitations. And then we go into the final beast apart from our Hague matters is the immigration without consent, which generally uh, get battered out or battled out within the high court. Step one, always consent is sought. In this instance, consent is refused. Now, what most attorneys do in this instance is they would send a letter to the spouse not consenting or the party not consenting or their attorneys and say, we want an investigation to be done um, to see what is in the best interest of this child. Do you agree, yes or no? Um, if they do not come back, very often, in most cases, the matter is returned referred to the High Court on a Part A, Part B uh, kind of structure. The first application, Part A, is for the uh, appointment of an expert, uh, formally by the court. Um, it could be either through the family advocate, um, but in a lot of these instances, we do see private practice social workers, psychologists becoming involved. And the second part of the Part A deals with just the logistics of coming back Part B is where the final order is sought for the court to allow the, the parent to, to relocate. After this Part A, you have your child participation, you have family advocates' involvement and or um, social worker psychologists' involvement, and there will be a report which is rendered indicating what is in the child's best interest. And in these instances, the court would then make an order dispensing with the consent of the non-consenting parent in terms of section 18.5. As we all know, High Court is the upper guardian of minor children. It can override the guardianship of the parties. Um, and then finally, departure from the Republic of South Africa. Now, there have been several notable judgments in this regard in the last year. I've veered away from um, reported cases and I've elected to rather look at recent cases, even in the instance that they aren't reported, just to give you guys an idea of the zip guys that we are seeing in the courts. How are the courts dealing with it? Now, I have done summaries, but I have also given you the reference to these cases. Um, all of them are freely available on SAFLI, and I encourage you, if you are working with someone in the process of, of immigration with a child, or if you're considering doing it yourself, please take the time to read these uh, judgments. Secondly, please understand I do not work for JITA or LexisNexis. I'm not a professional um, person when it comes to summarizing court cases. So there may be one or two things in my summary which you don't agree with, and um, then please feel free to contact me and we can have a, a bit of a debate about it. But for present purposes, I think this will give you a bit of, of an idea. The first matter which I would like to look at, and here I'm definitely going to have to read here, tells all the way from uh, the Johannesburg High Court, and this is F versus F, uh, this was in 2022, uh, judgment delivered on the 6th of April 2022 under the hand of Adams J. The applicant wants to take two daughters to the UK. There is already an order giving both parties full parental responsibilities and rights, obviously post-divorce. Um, respondent initially gave consent but then withdrew consent. What are the legal principles? And this is where I want to really focus. Number one, the court found best interests of the child or children in this case are the first and paramount consideration. Now, what I find is interesting here is it's not only the paramount, but also the first. The court used it as a starting point 
not as a lens uh, simply to see the other um, factors. Both parents have a joint primary responsibility. And then the question was asked, is the custodial parent's decision to emigrate bona fide and reasonable? And you'll see this as a trend. The court found it is, and the parent was given um, leave to relocate. Under the, the finding, folks, the second last um, bullet point, you'll see that the respondent section 18.3c3 and 4 rights are terminated. Terminated, not suspended, which I think is under the circumstances quite a harsh order against the respondent. But essentially what this means is the respondent's consent was no longer needed for application for a passport or departure from South Africa. All other parental responsibilities and rights are still extant and in existence. They are um, all subject to the court order made by, by the court. Contact is in place. Care is in place. Maintenance is obviously in place. And uh, the other aspects of guardianship are still uh, in existence. Right. So far, so good? Yeah. Great. I've got 15 minutes uh, before Dion chases me off, so I better run. Um, next one we're going to look at is OM versus MC. Now, this is quite a recent one. Excuse me. Once again, Johannesburg High Court. I indicated to you earlier I was very eager to come down to Cape Town. Everyone wants to bloom and leave Johannesburg. I wonder why. Anyway, so... This was 3 March 2023, very recent, under F. Beside note AJ. Now, this was a very interesting matter. The issue of relocation was not a problem. The father conceded that the relocation would be in the best interest. What was argued over here was a reintegration therapy between the father and the daughter. Uh, the father made... A couple of footfalls in the litigation, which came across very vexatiously to the court, consenting to something, withdrawing consent, consenting, withdrawing, and the court was quite displeased. Now, let's go to the findings in this matter. If I ever change here and I don't change there, please alert me. Um, the court interpreted the questions of law with the best interests of the child as the overriding consideration as required by the Constitution and the Children's Act. And the court also made uh, a comment that the High Court has wide powers to establish what is in the best interest of the child and is not limited only to the evidence presented by the parties, which um, I think is somewhat controversial. However, if one contextualizes it in bullet point three, the judge had a chamber interview with the child. So the child was obviously able to express their um, desires, wishes, and their feelings to the judge. Um, so in this case, the mom did manage to relocate with the child, um, and the logistical issues were sorted out. Why this is of relevance is it just gives us a good indication of uh, a matter where the judge spoke to the child himself as the judge is obviously entitled to do if one looks at um, the provisions of the Children's Act and the very good section on it in, in Darfel and Skelton's uh, commentary on the Children's Act in respect of, of that issue. Once again, just reiterates best interest of the child. As I say, when you're reading the Children's Act, you start counting from seven. Right. Um, now, let's have a look at the... Um, order, there would be uh, counseling, there would be reintegration therapy, etc. I'm not going to belabor you by going through the whole thing. JB versus RE from your division per uh, Bullet J, a very interesting judgment and a very interesting order, which I'd like to, to take you through once again. This is uh, all available on Safley free of charge. The applicant wants to permanently relocate with a child to Lyon, France. Respondent refused to provide consent, refused um, 
that the minor child accompany the applicant on a holiday even to Leon. The application was initially divided. Uh, number one was for a holiday. Number two um, was then for, for an expert, etc. Now, there were two experts involved in this matter. Both experts recommended um, that the applicant be permitted to relocate. Um, and in this instance, the court said, well, it is bona fide. The, the applicant has made out a case that, it is, uh, that she has a bona fide reason for wanting to relocate. The experts were with her that it's in the best interest of the child. Um, now, what is very interesting um, in terms of JB versus RE is the safeguards that Judge Villa put in in his order um, in respect of the minor child. So point one, the applicant was granted leave. Uh, number two, very nice protection for, for the respondent. Joint decisions about major issues concerning the child will be made by both parties. Once again, the, um, the execution of this in a foreign jurisdiction is problematic. We'll look at that in a bit. But a very nice safeguard that was put in. Here the court says even where the child will be going to school and who will res assume responsibilities for the schooling costs. You can see all of these potential parts where, where there could be snags. The court closes off. Then the court goes to, so far as to say this is how residents will work. Airbnb first three months, then she's allowed to secure accommodation not more than 20 kilometers from the school. So the judge is saying, great, you can go, but I am holding you to this specific area um, so that you cannot take the child um, and disappear into the wild blue yonder. Then um, the interesting portion of it, I'm going to skip over uh, a few um, of the issues, but X cannot be permanently removed from Lyon, France, not from France, from Lyon specifically, without prior written consent. Um, and then obviously there is reference to the Hague Convention, as well as that there be a parenting coordinator appointed. So this is, a, 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 in my view, a very thorough order um, in terms of practicalities post relocation. But next one, 19 December 2022, we are back in Johannesburg because everyone wants to leave Johannesburg. Uh, 19 December 2022, under MIA J, uh, once again, desire to relocate, opposed. Child has indicated a desire to relocate. The family advocate recommended that there be a relocation. Um, the first respondent purported to be concerned about the child's safety in Croatia. Um, the, the court simply said that can be uh, ameliorated by regular contact and option to return to RSA if necessary. And the court in this instance weighed up the relationship between the child and the applicant versus the child and the first respondent. Um, so, once again, best interests of the child are paramount. I'm sounding like a broken record, but I should sound like a broken record. Start reading from Section 7. Best interests of the child are paramount. Then the court reiterates that each case must be decided on its own merit. When the interests of the child and an adult are not congruent, I love this, the adult's interests must yield to what promotes the child's best interests. Adults, suck it up, buttercup, do what's best for the child. Right, um, principle applicable to relocation, interests of the child are first and paramount consideration. Um, and a very interesting statement here, in most cases, if the custodian parent wishes to emigrate, the court will not likely refuse leave for the children to be taken out of the country if the decision is shown to be bona fide and reasonable. At this point, I would like to point out to you, we've gone through five judgments and we have five out of five court permitted the relocation. So, what was the order? Once again, a very, very uh, thorough order from uh, Mia J um, dealing with 
aspects of, of school, uh, medical, passports, etc. Um, now, the interesting um, order here is three bullet points from the bottom. The applicant is to obtain a mirror order within Croatia within three months of relocation. Now, as I indicated to you earlier, folks, South African law is applicable within the borders of South Africa. How we get past this generally in international family law matters is you obtain a mirror order. And while I look at that fully a little bit later, essentially it means you go to the court in the host jurisdiction, in this case, um, Croatia, and you go to the court and say, look, this is the order I've got from a South African court. I want an order from this court on the same terms to make the South African um, order um, executable within uh, Croatia. So respondent may do so um, with uh, if the applicant fails to do it. Obviously, a very, very important um, safeguard for the respondent. Right, then we are back in the beautiful Western Cape uh, under the hand of Clutter J, 20 October 2022. Once again, relocation to UK. Father opposes citing severance of his bond. Um, the experts assessed um, and recommended continuing monitoring of father's alcohol dependency, etc. Now, here was something very interesting. There were two experts, Pettigrew and Campbell. Pettigrew recommended relocation. Campbell uh, denied relocation or um, indicated that it would not be uh, in the child's best interest. So here, obviously, the court had to really make a decision. And unlike the Solomon matters, there really is no way to cut the baby in half. You cannot substantially relocate. You cannot be substantially pregnant, as we all know. So the court had the unenviable task um, of making the decision uh, in place of competing expert reports. Now, the legal principles as applied by Clitor J here are quite interesting. The court must take an overall view to determine if the custodial parent's decision is reasonable. Once again, I've told you in the previous ones, this is quite a trend. Uh, the child's best interest, very interestingly, the court found is paramount, but are not absolute. Um, I don't know if I agree with that statement. Nevertheless, um, it is an element of this judgment, and they must be considered in relation to other rights. Custodial parents' rights involve fundamental rights, dignity, dignity privacy, freedom of movement, Limitations apply to the best interests injunction in consideration of other rights. Each case must be decided on its own merits. This case illustrates the balancing act, obviously, that the court has to fulfill in uh, weighing up the rights of the parts in the child. Right, and Pettigrew won the day. The mother was granted leave to remove the child from South Africa to relocate to the United Kingdom. Right. So, uh, essentially, we went through eight cases, all eight cases recently. Relocation was permitted by the court. Um, that is not to say that a court will just rub rubber stamp a relocation, folks. The um, reason for the relocation must be bona fide and it must be in the best interests of the minor child. Do not try to relocate to a war zone, in other words. <laughs> Challenges post-immigration, let's look at those. As I alluded to earlier, uh, and I'm going to use the two examples, Section 44 of the Children's Act, Section 62 of the Maintenance Act. If the child ain't here, the court ain't got power. That is a big problem that we are faced with, is the issue of jurisdiction um, of the courts once the child has been removed. Conflict of laws between countries is a, a massive problem. A good example is uh, Australia. They simply refuse to give effect to a South African ANC. They take a look at it and they say, well, we're going to do what we want to do anyway, you know. So um, nothing we can do about that, unfortunately. Um, so laws between countries vary if they are inconsistent with one another, which system is to be preferred. Dion, have I got another five or ten? Okay, excellent. Not in trouble yet. Great. Um, 
Practical difficulties, obviously, contact, expense, time, location. Flight tickets are expensive, visas are expensive. Major decisions in co-parenting. Remember, folks, we were talking about this unequal relationship that is created the minute the custodial parent leaves the borders of South Africa, the other parent is essentially beholden to what we can term the custodial or the relocating parent um, to find out what's going on in the child's life. There is an issue of distance. There is a potential issue of not being able to contact certain role players. In some instances, there is even a language barrier uh, in respect of some countries. And then, obviously, guardianship. As I mentioned earlier, Section 183C passports and leaving South Africa are problematic. Now, I've put a rider in there if SA citizenship is retained. If you are, as a child, not a South African citizen, Customs is going to give you one look and say, there you go, no problem. They simply uh, are concerned with South African uh, children in respect of the requirements to leave the Republic. So, as I uh, indicated to you earlier, mirror orders can be obtained to, to give effect to, um, uh, to orders in South Africa. So, I've put in a little bit of a definition for you. You're welcome to read through that at your own uh, leisure. Then, uh, obviously, the renewal of passports and visits to South Africa. Very problematic, 183C3 and 4. And that is where we look at subsection 5. Now, subsection 5 is generally the section in which the, the battle occurs in, an, in a contested relocation matter. And I say so because the court has, as upper guardian, the right and the responsibility to intervene um, in respect of guardianship issues. This section quite quite strangely worded, um, worded in the negative, unless a competent court orders otherwise, consent is required. Um, but I, essentially, I suppose it means the exact same as a court may intervene if one party um, does not consent. <laughs> Right, then we look at section 28. Now, section 28 deals with termination, suspension of parental responsibilities and rights. I just want to uh, once again reiterate that it is not a Boolean question. It's not a yes or no. Here, one can be substantially pregnant, as they say. Um, you do not have to suspend or terminate all parental responsibilities and rights. You can terminate or suspend any or all. And what we very frequently see in these matters is that the um, staying behind parents, um, 183C3 and 4, would be suspended or terminated just to make administration issues a little bit easier. Then uh, I'm just briefly going to allude to the, the Remo Act. I'm not going to go into detail with that. I really look forward to hearing uh, Dion speak in respect to that. Uh, what I have given you, folks, however, is just a list of all of the states that have acceded to, to that convention. And then, obviously, just the bare basics on Hague Convention matters. As I indicated earlier, I'm very eager to hear uh, Eugene chat about this a little bit later. Um, but just as a foundation, be aware of the functioning of central authorities in jurisdictions um, who work together or ostensibly are meant to work together to secure the return of children. Uh, in South Africa, folks, Office of the Family Advocate is designated as our central authority, and I have given you an up-to-date list of all of these signatory countries. Now... I want to talk to mediators, attorneys, and members of the public in my last slide. Um, here are your tips when you deal with immigration matters. Please, as a starting point, research and understand the laws and the requirements of the destination country before mediating, I put on the slide, but before dealing with these matters. Understand that when the child arrives in the host country, they will be subject to the laws of that country. 
and it is in your best interest to understand those laws as a starting point. Number two, as I indicated earlier, children are not just passengers. They're not just along for the ride. Ensure that they're given an opportunity to participate in the mediation process. Anecdotally, uh, some of you met my daughter yesterday, five going on 16, uh, and she wanted to, with all her heart, relocate to Dublin in Ireland. I said to her, my angel, why? She said, because they have a Disney shop there. <laughs> Can't make this up. Um, and when I, I pulsed her, and I said, but Opa and Omar are here. Your friends are here. She said, oh, yeah, that, that's true. And you can see the, the gears grinding with Disney shop on the one hand and family on the other hand, and it was a legitimate concern. But it just goes to show that children, even at that tender age, can think reasonably. They have the right to know what is um, lying ahead for them. Uh, plan ahead to ensure all necessary arrangements are made uh, before the immigration date. Um, if you are not someone who specializes in expat work, I highly recommend speaking to someone who does. Um, generally, uh, most attorneys are more than happy to, to share their information with colleagues and, and give guidance. Um, then consider the need for mirror, mirror orders, identify and include safeguards to protect the interests of all parties involved, encourage open and honest communication between parties to promote understanding and trust. I want to just pause here to, to just remind you of the practical difficulties with immigration matters. Um, the opportunities for conflict, very high. One cannot read tone or expression necessarily through a WhatsApp message or through an email. Um, there is very, very high potential for um, lapses in communication, and it's therefore extremely important to encourage open communication because the parties are going to have a devil of a time communicating across borders, no matter how amicable their split. Be respectful of cultural differences and ensure that all parties are aware of any potential challenges that may arise. Um, obviously, uh, that relates to the host country as well as um, in South African context. Top priority, folks. Broken record again. Best interests of the child. Um, I will uh, pass on to Dion also to distribute to those of you who are interested uh, uh, just a decision tree that I did a while back. And the first question you always ask, is it in the best interest of the child? If yes, proceed. If no, stop. Go back. Go to jail. Go directly to jail. Don't pass. Begin. Don't collect 200 grand. Go to jail. And finally, folks, consider the emotional impact of immigration on all parties involved and work to provide appropriate support and resources as needed. Um, as I indicated to you earlier, Disney Shop is a very poor um, replacement for family, friends, culture, language, climate, understanding, feeling the land of your bones beneath your feet. So that was it for me, folks. I'm very humbled by the opportunity to have spoken to you. I really hope that I have uh, given you some food for thought. Uh, in terms of international relocation with minor children. And uh, I hope it sets the stage for our esteemed speakers later today. Thank you very much for having me.